Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I was thinking about what we could have done here that would remember him. So we can give thanks to God for having a good dad. The biggest thing before taking the shot was my adrenaline started pumping and my heart is racing. In the face of this terrible disease, there's suddenly a lot of attention going to bats. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Texas has the highest diversity of bats of any state. And so anybody who loves wildlife should try to make time or, or find the opportunity to see these bats emerge. It's, it's always really fun. In the face of this terrible disease, there's suddenly a lot of attention going to bats. Bats have been maligned for thousands of years. Most people don't have any contact with bats, so what they know about them is what they've seen on TV. And most of the time on TV, especially if it's Hollywood, they're blood-sucking monsters. Animal bats, the kind that fly? People think all bats have rabies, and they don't. It says some of them bats is rabbit. They're not carriers. If a bat gets sick with rabies, it dies. Well, and that ain't all. People think bats are blind. None of our species of bats are blind. It was full of what looked like huge bats. Besides using echolocation to navigate and hunt for their food, they're also using their eyesight, so bats aren't blind. A lot of people think bats will get in their hair. So we dispel that myth. I think a lot of people are, are afraid of bats because they don't know much about them. And like most things, the more you learn about them, the more interesting they become, the less scary they become, and quickly we begin to realize that bats are actually quite beneficial to humans. Texas is really special for bats. We have the largest congregations of bats in the entire world. People travel all over the world to see Bracken Bat Cave, Old Tunnel State Park, Congress Street Bridge. It's a wildlife phenomenon in Texas. The majority of bats uh, wake up as we're going to bed and they'll go eat insects. And they eat huge, huge, huge numbers of insects. There's actually a long history of people working with bats and benefiting from bats. From March to October, bats are gonna eat tons of bugs. Uh, those are primary agricultural pests in the area, so you got cotton bull moth, the corn earworm moth, uh, army cutworm. Because of that, farmers, one, don't have crop damage, two, don't have to spray a lot of pesticides on their crops to kill those bugs. If you like bananas or chocolate or tequila, you can think of bat. So this is where we're at, or at the entrance here. Uh, here in North America, we got 47 different species of bats. And here in Texas, we have 33 different species. In these caves, they're all hibernating bats. We've got like uh, four species that we generally encounter. Cave myotis the tricolored bat, the big brown bat, and Townsend's big-eared bat. They all generally like these cold, stable caves. Uh, makes it easy for them to hibernate, and uh, each one of them has unique requirements. Cave environments are extremely sensitive. They are tied in with underground aquifers and water systems. They oftentimes have endemic species or species that are only found in that one spot. And cave systems have very few nutrients. There's very little input of, of nutrients coming into those systems. Okay. Okay. We've been counting the number of bats within each of these caves, uh, identifying the species, 
and collecting swab samples to contribute to this greater national white nose surveillance effort. White nose syndrome. White nose syndrome. What is this white nose syndrome? It's called white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome. The deadly white nose syndrome. Uh, white nose syndrome is a devastating disease. Uh, it is a new disease first detected in the winter of 2006, 2007. And I can even remember those first random emails going through the bat community chain pictures of these bats with this fungus on their nose. Does anybody know what this fungus is? Nobody knew because it was brand new. It's caused by a cold-loving fungus, Pseudogymnoastis destructans, or PD. That fungus is not native here to America. Our North American bats have no adaptations to respond to it, and consequently it's devastating them. Bats that are susceptible to white nose tend to share a, a common trait in that they all hibernate. Hibernation for a bat, there's a very narrow budget of energy that they're trying to make last for many months. So the way that white nose hurts them is by irritating their skin while they're hibernating. And just the process of waking up, cleaning off your, your wings and, and fidgeting around a little bit burns off critical energy and the result is starvation. We've lost at least 5.7 million bats, probably more. The fungus or the disease is now found in 30 U.S. states and five Canadian provinces. And we see devastating population declines uh, wherever it goes. Some bats are very severely impacted by it and we see almost total population collapse. It has since spread kind of out from that spot down the southeastern part of the country and worked its way towards Texas at about a rate of 200 miles per year. Based on predictive models for how the disease was going to spread, it appeared that it was going to be funneled through the panhandle of Texas into the western states. We had clear battle lines drawn, we knew which direction the enemy was advancing. All of a sudden, to have it show up in Washington State, now it's coming from behind us as well. It's definitely not encouraging, and it is actually quite alarming. The challenge of treating white nose syndrome is much more complicated than just treating the disease. We can't just think about curing the bat of the disease. We also have to be aware of potential impacts to the cave ecosystem. If we sprayed a fungicide or some major disruptive chemical into a cave, we just don't know how that might impact the system. So the plan in Texas is to take advantage of this window of opportunity we have now to learn as much as we can about bats before the disease gets here and be prepared if an opportunity to apply some kind of treatment arises. And, and, and luckily we have a lot of smart researchers working on, on solving that problem, but I think we still have a long ways to go. Nature is so incredibly complex that the more we look, the more we learn with pretty much any species. Each species of bat is unique, fills a specific niche, and we have so much to learn from them. The loss of any one of these species is a real tragedy. I'm Ralston Dorn and I work as a paramedic for Adeptus Health in the ER. It's a small community ER. We have anywhere between about six to nine beds. Hello, Benny. Estelle, ready to come back? Yes. I help out the physician. 
the nurse and the radiology technologist with various tasks that they may need. Can you bring your hands above your head? When I'm not on the clock, I do the typical things that guys my age do. Hang out with a girlfriend, go to movies, um, hang out with friends, that sort of thing. But most recently, I've gotten into hunting. I come from a family line of hunters. And I'm the only one that hasn't been hunting. <laughs> hey, good morning. Hey, Ralston? Yes, sir. Hey, Are you Justin? Justin? And my middle name is Hunter, nice ironically you. enough. Welcome to East Lake. My dad used to hunt, but then when I was about 10 years old, he quit. And so for the last 21 years, no one in my immediate family has ever hunted. And so I said, I want to finally break that cycle, so I found this through the Parks and Wildlife and signed up for it. This mentored hunting program is for adults. We have lots of youth hunting programs around the state. Our own Texas Youth Hunting Program that takes lots of kids hunting, but there just aren't that many opportunities for adults. So this is an opportunity for them to come out, take part in a hunt, learn from experienced hunters, and uh, be able to take those skills back to their friends and family so that they can go hunting. Prior to today, no one had ever shot a deer. We're all newbies. One guy's an electrical engineer. I work in healthcare, obviously, he's a paramedic. Another guy, I can't remember what he does, he's uh, from Egypt. So I think it's a wide range of backgrounds and applications. What a beautiful tree, wow. Yeah, we had uh, Kristen out here. She went out and hunt with a guide, and from what I understand, she doesn't even come from a hunting background, but it was pretty cool to see her get out here and to try something new. <laughs> we are hot on the right. We just took the participants through some hunter education activities, including live firing exercise. They all sighted in their firearms, which is one of those things that every hunter needs to do responsibly before a hunt. We had some fun just shooting 22s and getting familiar with other types of firearms. The first day we went over uh, kind of the ethics of hunting, when to shoot, when not to shoot. We wouldn't want to shoot at that because that's a ricochet shot. You know, the actual shooting or harvesting of the deer is, is probably 1% of the hunt. If all the teeth were worn out, of course, it'd be seven and a half, eight and a half in the wild. You know, what you do afterwards, aging it, feeling their teeth, and uh, kind of figuring out how old the deer is, and then the process of cleaning it and processing it. Real fatty. I think it was eating some pecans up there. <laughs> Jesse Griffiths is a very well-known Austin wild game chef and uh, volunteered his time and came out, cooked dinner for us, then gave us a butchery demo yesterday. It's fat. It has very little flavor, and it you can just use it to wrap things in. And then when you grill it, that stuff just shrinks up around it and gets crispy. Yeah. So we got some wild boar carnitas, uh, some beans, uh, tortillas, and there's two different salsas over there. Both of them are probably going to be pretty spicy. Did he get a bite? I'm very excited, very proud. Uh, got my first deer, and it was great. The biggest thing before taking the shot was my adrenaline started pumping. And at one point I told, I looked over and I told Justice, I said, my heart is racing. And he goes, all right. He goes, we'll just hang out for a second, slow down. Okay, she's broadside. Whenever you have a good shot, go ahead and take it. Got it. Good shot, man. Great shot. Had I gone hunting, you know, with my uncle or cousin, I'm sure I could have maybe gotten a deer, but I don't think I would have learned nearly as much after the shot or before the shot as I did here. Who should take a mentored hunt? People who are self-reliant, resourceful, want to know where their meat comes from. You know, not just trust a FDA stamp at a supermarket. The organic food movement, I mean, there's nothing more organic than harvesting your own animal out in the wild on public property. There's a large group of people, especially in that millennial age group, you know, somewhere between 25 to 40, that in an increasingly urbanized United States and Texas especially, that just doesn't have that 
ability to go out somewhere. They don't know people. There's a huge market for it, and it's a necessary market to help get them involved because they can be the next set of volunteers and just, you know, renew that cycle over. After completing hunter education, getting a hunting license, time to show up here, and the only other piece of paper they have to have is a mentored hunting permit. So you went down this way? Yeah. So I consider this a pretty great life skill to be able to go and you know provide meat for your family and uh, now they've got that skill and they can take that and teach it to their kids and pass it on yeah i'm gonna take my kids my daughter really wants to go she would be she would probably push me out of the way to do all this she's 15. <laughs> or the deep mentors if you're a harry potter fan. The mentors. <laughs> One, two, three, time trap. <laughs> I started sent my father a picture saying, hey, because um, I used his gun to kind of keep the family tradition alive. So he's really happy. He's wanting, he told me, he said, all right, now I, he goes, I expect deer meat for Christmas presents. So. <laughs> it was great. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a deer on my side, but had a amazing mentor who just basically walked me through every step of it. The staff here was great. It was quite an experience. It was something that, you know, if anybody else out there really wanted to do, I would highly recommend it. It took the scary away from hunting. It took kind of the unknown. Sometimes we fear things that we don't know and we aren't really too knowledgeable about. And for me, it kind of gave me that knowledge to make me a little bit more comfortable, I guess. That's the best part of it right there. Thank you very much. You bet, man. It was Appreciate a pleasure. It. Pleasure is mine. Absolutely. I'll see you back one day. Yeah, definitely. Yay. Yay. Awesome. <laughs> I've gone back and done deer hunting. I harvested a deer this past hunting season with a bow, and then I've also gotten big into duck hunting. I had made deer chili for her in the crock pot, and she said it was amazing, said it was the best chili she's ever had. There's a big advantage to being, to being, to having the broader perspective. You're in an enormously changing environment, doubling a population in your lifetime. And with that happening, you've got to be sure that those people have jobs. You've got to be sure that they've got transportation. You've got to be sure they've got to have a place to live. And at the same time, to be sure that the wildlife and the other things aren't frozen out, which means you've got to work together. Can you turn around? You ready? Yeah. That one's gonna be tough. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> One lesson from my dad, he taught me a lot about um, being a man and just being a person of faith and caring for family and how to be a good friend. He wanted Eric and Diana and I to live our own lives, our dreams, and to pursue our passions. And so to honor him would be to honor God and to leave this world better than you found it. You have to give back, always. When the Stumberg family immigrated from Germany, they were in search of the American dream. The family settled in San Antonio and ran a general store near the Alamo for decades. After World War II, the Stumberg started a company called Patio Foods. As the business grew, the family was quick to share their success. 
Lewis was involved in everything from the Boy Scouts to being a longtime civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army to serving on the Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission. When you have a husband that knows how to do things, you let him do his own thing and allow him the time to do it. Yeah. I caught one! Oh, I know. Oh, oh, hey, you fish! Don't run away! We need somebody to help identify a tree. I can. I can do it. You can, can you tell Uncle Herbie what kind of tree he caught? Part of the job I have is to take care of this place and make sure at least one of our children wants to take care of it for the next generation. Nice, let it drop. Go. Good one. I, got a splash. I want Erickson to know he's loved. Remember, you want a good flat one. Loved by God, loved by me, and I want him to have a love of this land. I would love Erickson to have a, a heart for this place so that he can enjoy it and that he can care for it too. My grandfather passed it down to my dad, and my dad, when he dies, he's going to pass it down to all my family. Actually, come over and help me, bud. I'm excited, but I don't want him to, I would miss my dad being with me here. It's a pretty good sized fish, isn't it? The Stumbergs own two ranches, this one near Kerrville and another in South Texas. It's the ranch in South Texas, where Herb and Eric host a yearly hunt for friends of their father. Get that baked on. After Dad died, I wanted to honor his friends. Get in line, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because his friends were incredibly meaningful to him. Dear Lord, we're most thankful for this gathering of friends and loved ones. We're particularly thankful for the memory of, of the man who made this ranch possible. We ask that you guide us to continue to steward this land the way he showed us. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. When you lose your dad, you know, he's such an important part of your life that it, it's a reminder of how fortunate I was. <laughs> What time are the deer coming out? They should be out a little after five. The people who make a difference in my life, my wife, my brother, my family, my children, the last thing they're gonna hear from me is I love you. Because I want that to be the last thing that they hear from me. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. All right, you send me a picture. Well, I certainly have to make hard choices. But that doesn't mean they're impossible choices. As long as you can say to yourself, look, I want to try to find a good solution, rather than just saying, this is the way you're going to do it. You're going to do it my way, or you're not going to do it at all. That's no solution. I was thinking about what we could have done here that would remember him. So we can give thanks to God for having a good dad. You look to the horizon, and you can see there's more high ground to take. There are more ways than ever to help Texas Parks and Wildlife protect the outdoors through the Conservation License Plate Program. More than $9 million has been generated from the sale of these plates, funding wildlife research and big game restoration, protecting native species and their habitats, studying fish populations to improve Texas fishing. How do you like that? Improving Texas state parks through reforestation and other projects. We got one. Yes, yes. Every plate on a car, truck, trailer, or motorcycle means more money to support wild things and wild places in Texas.